Good morning, Dr. Zinn. Good morning. Uh, would you please state your name for the record again? Uh, Howard Zinn. Uh, where do you reside, Dr. Zinn? In Auburndale, Massachusetts. Uh, how are you employed? I am on the faculty of Boston University. In what capacity? I'm a professor of political science at Boston University. Uh, could you uh, relate your educational background? Uh, I received my undergraduate degree at uh, New York University. I received my master's degree at Columbia University, my PhD at Columbia University, and uh, did postdoctoral work at Harvard University. Uh, doctor, have you uh, published? Yes. Uh, with specific uh, reference uh, to the field of civil disobedience, have you done undertaken any professional work in uh, that field? Well, I've given many papers before scholarly meetings on civil disobedience. I've written lots of articles on civil disobedience for national journals. I wrote a book called Disobedience and Democracy. Uh, and uh, I've dealt with the problem of civil disobedience in, in a number of my books. Uh, I, I would guess that of, of the uh, approximately 10 books that I've published that uh, pr probably uh, more than half of them deal in one way or another with the question of civil disobedience. For the record, the court is going to determine that the doctor is qualified in the matter of the history of civil disobedience. You may proceed. Dr. Zinn, you may know that the seven of us defendants went into Avco Systems Division on July 14, 1983, because they make their missile X version two components, cruise missiles, etc., cetera, in a uh, civil disobedient action. As a historian, a student, a teacher, have you had occasion to study nonviolent movements and protest actions in the United States? I have, yes. In American history, have any peaceful protest movements proven effective in change? in changing national policies concerning significant social issues, in your opinion? The, uh, the history of uh, actions of uh, nonviolent civil disobedience, uh, that history goes all the way back uh, to the revolutionary period and the pre-revolutionary period. Uh, that is the achieving of American independence, a very, very important policy change, uh, was due uh, very directly to acts, constant acts of civil disobedience against the laws of England, acts of trespassing, acts of destruction of property. Uh, of course, the most famous of these is the Boston Tea Party, but there were many other acts of uh, disobedience against the Stamp Act, against the Intolerable Acts, uh, against the Tea Act, against the Iron Act, against uh, various of the statutes passed by uh, the British government, which the colonies uh, disobeyed, uh, violated, and uh, created the conditions which led to American independence. Uh, and the, the Declaration of Independence itself is the, the, the statement uh, of the colonists which summarizes uh, theoretically their acts of civil disobedience. It was saying that uh, governments and by implication, laws are set up by the people who achieve certain ends. And when these government and laws do not serve these ends of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, then the people have the right to disobey. Uh, after the Revolutionary War, in the early part of the 19th century, in the period before the Civil War, we saw innumerable acts of civil disobedience directed against the Fugitive Slave Act directed against the institution of slavery. The abolitionist movement, the movement of white people and black people who opposed slavery, and slavery was legal. Slavery was legal by state law, and slavery was legal by federal law. And these laws were violated. The Fugitive Slave Act was a federal law passed in, 19, in 1850. That law was violated again and again by people who refused to send a black people who had escaped from slavery back to slavery. That often involved breaking down doors, breaking into buildings, committing destruction against property, trespassing, doing all sorts of things which on the face of the action seemed violations of law, but were ultimately seen as necessary moral acts and 
which unquestionably led finally to the elimination of slavery. In the period of the late 19th century and early 20th century and into the 1930s, we saw many, many acts of civil disobedience by working people who were working for 12, 14, 16 hours a day in, I might say, in the textile mills of Lowell and Lawrence, in mines and railroads and places all over this country, working long hours, low pay, industrial accidents, 13,000 people killed every year in industrial accidents in those terrible years of industrialization, and workers committed acts of civil disobedience against that, violated laws, uh, uh, walked out, uh, sometimes occupied plants, uh, trespassed, uh, violated local ordinances, all of this to call attention to the working conditions that they were enduring. And the effects of these were to have laws passed. The 20th century is known as the age of reform because in the 20th century we began to see laws that were passed to begin to change the hours, working conditions, wages of working people. In the 1930s, well, again, with, with Roosevelt, we see the same kind of situation that we saw with Lincoln, a good-hearted man, but a man who did not move strongly on the issue of guaranteeing certain of labor's rights until there were massive acts of civil disobedience in the 1930s by the labor movement, general strikes, takeovers of cities, violations of property rights, trespassing. These taking place in San Francisco, all through the city, to take over the city in a general strike. Minneapolis, a general strike. Textile workers all through the South, 400,000 of them. A wave of actions like this. Tenants' actions, again, violating laws, violating the laws of eviction in order to put the people's furniture back into their houses after these poor people were evicted for non-payment of rent. Uh, all of these things were going on in the 30s. These actions led to the New Deal. The New Deal legislation, which we now hail, which everybody accepts, which every president since that time has had to accept to some degree or another, whether they were Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative. All of these reforms, which we now have on the books, are the result of the things that these people did, and very often against the law, in the 1930s. With all the terrible things that can happen with labor problems, or domestic issues, e even with questions of segregation, terrible things that happen to people. In foreign policy, you're dealing with millions of lives. And it's ironic, and yet it's true, that in that area where the greatest stakes are involved, millions of lives are involved in the United States and in other countries. And in fact, in, in our time, stakes greater than any previous war has ever had. In that area, to ask the American people to go by the normal legal processes of democracy is to mislead them, to delude them. The, Democrat, the only way democracy can be restored in the area of foreign policy is if the American people assert themselves in various ways. Civil disobedience is not something outside the realm of democracy. S democracy requires civil disobedience. Without civil disobedience, democracy does not exist.